with Leslie Stewart from the San Ramon Valley Genealogical Society and she would like to discuss some shocks and surprises in family history research. Yes, well, one of my shocks and surprises uh, was when I started following up on some material that I'd gotten from my mother's side of the family when I first started looking into this. I found out that I had a, my great-grandfather's cousin had apparently gotten away with murder. Uh, the, he had a fairly distinctive name. His name was Eliphalet Keen. And so I thought, well, it would be pretty easy to just start out by Googling him and finding out whether there was anything out there about him. Well, first it turns out Eliphalet isn't that unusual a name, but something did pop up almost right away. And it was an old newspaper article from the section of Wisconsin uh, in the southwest corner, very rural, uh, out of the way. This is the only thing that I ever found about him, but it was the key information. And it talked about the fact that Eliphalet had married a woman called Evelina Waddle, and her brother, William Waddle, disapproved of the marriage. And William Waddle went around town talking, trash talking about Eliphalet. And this got back to Eliphalet nat naturally. And so one day when he was out riding his horse, he ran into William Waddle. And he said to William Waddle, you stop talking that way about me. Well, you know, obviously this was in the <laughs> 18, 1849, so he didn't put it in quite that way. Uh, and William Waddle said, well, he said, you know, you are an old so-and-so. And he turned away, apparently, to his, the ox cart that he was driving. And Eliphalet apparently thought he was going for a weapon. And Eliphalet pulled a knife out of his jacket and stabbed him to death. And he died on the spot in front of his poor mother, who was apparently in the ox cart at the time. Well, according to the newspaper item, Eliphalet turned himself in and was waiting for trial at the next circuit court round. And I thought, well, that was the end of Eliphalet. But in fact, it wasn't. I later found a couple of things. One was that in the 1850 census, which is only a year, was about a year and a half after this happened, there was Eliphalet at home with his wife, Evelina, and a new baby. So obviously he had made it that far. And then there was an entry in the family Bible that somebody sent me uh, that said that he had died in 1852. So whatever his cause of death, he had managed to get away with what he did to poor William Waddle. Uh, the, he could have gotten away on the basis of self-defense. He did think that William was going for a weapon. Uh, but he apparently didn't live to enjoy his wife and family for all that long. And I sometimes wonder what home life must have been right after he had stabbed William, unless perhaps William and Evelina hadn't gotten along that well to begin with. So that was my first shock, and it was a really interesting thing. Later on, I found a letter from a great aunt who was writing about a uh, woman who was going to be married in, marrying into the family, and she said to her relative, well, I hope she knows about the skeletons in the closet like Eliphalet. And I thought, oh, well, at least I found out what was going on with him, or it would have driven me nuts to go and chase that down. <laughs> I never did find another newspaper item. It was a very, very small paper to begin with, and apparently there were not many copies left for archives. So wh where did you find this paper? I found this paper in a, something called newspapers.com, which is a newspaper archive. It's a subscription site, but I got myself, when I found this fascinating item, I got myself a free trial subscription to it, and that allowed me to get online and get this particular article, which I have cherished. All right. So, and then the next thing that um, I ran into was that I had a great aunt, and this, this is all from my mother's side of the family because that was where I had gotten most material to start with. Uh, I had a great aunt who had married 
after a great deal of dis de debate back and forth with her family as to whether or not she should marry this young man. He had visited the house many times. My grand great-grandmother's journals um, talk about the fact that um, they had met him, that they had gone places with him, but apparently they even went so far as to go to a medium to just to try and figure out whether or not Gertie should marry Richard Davenport. And eventually the marriage did take place, and then the journals make it look like it wasn't a tremendously happy marriage because Gertie was coming home all the time and then going back and coming home and going back. Well, eventually she had a child, and shortly after she had the child, this was in the, the uh, period of time in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, and the Alaskan gold rush was in full swing, and these people were living in Seattle, and there were lots and lots of people going to Alaska all the time. And Richard Davenport, who had been earning his living as either an artist or a painter or a sign painter, it isn't, it, the records vary, but he decided to go to Alaska. And he went to Alaska, and he never came back. And so according to everything that the family knew, he went to Alaska that people sometimes didn't come back. It was a pretty dangerous and, and difficult kind of environment up there. So Gertie waited for over seven years, and then she remarried and had a fairly happy second marriage. But when I was started to research this part of the family, I found that there was a Richard Davenport living in Chicago only a few years after Gertie's Richard Davenport had gone to Alaska. And the Richard Davenport, who was living in Chicago, had parents who were born in the same places that Gertie's Richard Davenport had, and he was working as a sign painter. Well, and he was married. He had another, he had, in fact, he had two more children. So it was pretty clear to me that this was the same Richard Davenport. And then, this was in the 1850 census that I, 1850 census, no, uh, yeah. So anyhow, in the following census, he did not show up. This was in the, uh, pardon me, this was in the, I think the 1900 census. But in the following census, he doesn't show up. Only his wife does, without the two children. And in the following census, she's with one of the children. So evidently, Richard was once again gone. And when I looked into it before I did the, the research for this particular little talk, I found a birth certificate, a death certificate for Richard in Nevada, which of course is miles away. Again, the information about his marriage and whatever at that point matched up with the marriage records for his second wife. He had died in a county hospital. They didn't know a lot about him, but they knew her name. So it was clearly the right guy. And there he was, years and years later in Nevada, and I can't find out what happened to him in between. He must have just slipped through the cracks over and over again. But he married a woman, and she had a baby, and he left. And then he married another woman, and she had two babies, and he left. And so that was the story about Gertie's husband who died in Alaska because, in fact, Gertie's husband didn't die in Alaska. He lived for a long time afterwards. So the, the family mythology was that uh, he disappeared or died. The, the idea right. was he died. He died. They were sure that he had... Uh, I mean, she waited the seven years. Obviously, she couldn't be absolutely sure. Uh, maybe her next husband wanted to be sure. But that was what the family told us, and that was what was in the letters back and forth that I had seen, was poor Gertie, her husband went to Alaska and he died. Well, th this, this is really uh, seemingly a, a, an incredible series of, of lucky events that led you to the correct information. And it, it seems like uh, this is a very uh, common name, you know, uh, Richard Davenport. Right, and you would be, except I was a little bit helped by the fact that I was able to find the Washington marriage certificate for when he and Gertie got married 
And that was one of the types of marriage records where the bride and groom put down quite a bit of information about themselves. And so I had an age for him. I had where his parents had been born and his parents' names. Um, and again, not tremendously distinctive, but I could tell that his mother had been born in Louisiana, uh, which was, you know, not that usual for somebody who was at that point getting married in Seattle. And uh, a couple of other things like his, what he was doing for a living that really helped when I started to look for census records and other records down the line. That was how I could identify him as being the same Richard Davenport in Chicago because I knew where his parents had been born. I knew what he was doing for a living. All right, Th this is really interesting. Now, uh, can you share a little bit about the family stories that turned out not to be true? Well, yes, a couple of those, um, you know, well, to a certain extent, Gertie's story was kind of like that, but it, he did disappear in Alaska. Uh, then I had the very interesting <laughs> experience when I started looking at something that I knew, thought I knew perfectly well, which was my um, grandparents, my maternal grandparents' wedding date, which was carefully noted down in the um, family history type book of one of the families of, that I'm descended from. And the, they had used the back pages of that book almost like a family Bible, and they'd put down the dates of various family members um, marriages and deaths and, and that kind of information. And so I had this date carefully written in there for when my parents had gotten, uh, grandparents had gotten married on July 2nd, 1904. They'd been married in Vancouver, British Columbia. They were living in Seattle. Um, Vancouver was kind of the Gretna Green at the time, the kind of place that you went to get married if, you're, if you were eloping. And I knew that my grandmother's family had not particularly approved of my grandfather. Um, she had met him because he was, along with her brother, coaching her women's basketball team. And they weren't too sure about him. Um, so, I, I, and in addition, they'd had the experience already of Gertie's marriage and another disastrous marriage in the family, and I think they were a little gun-shy on this. So I figured, okay, they'd eloped to Vancouver. And letters showed that that was the anniversary that date that they observed for their 50th anniversary. My grandmother wrote about what her, her brother had given her a newspaper with the date on the front page of the, you know, the July 2nd, 1904 date. So imagine my surprise when I started going online and researching this just to make sure that I had the official information in my files. And I found a Vancouver wedding for them, but it wasn't until April 1905. And my first aunt was born in November of 1905. So what I figure is that once they realized that Aunt Dorothy was on the way, they hastily went to Vancouver, tied the knot, and told the family, oh, remember that trip we took to Vancouver last year? We got married then. And that was what got put down in the family records. But I'm interested in the fact that, that they faithfully maintained the fictitious date for the rest of their lives as their wedding anniversary. They must have known. They must have remembered. But there it is. And it's clearly the right people in the official Vancouver record. The, again, there's one of those marriage things where you put down a lot of information about yourself. But they just didn't get married when they said they didn't. Th this would seem to uh, happen more than, than you would expect because there, there, are, there are people with, uh, with wildly differencing uh, in, in marriage dates. Yes, there are. And... And one of the things we're cautioned about in many of the genealogy talks is, you know, just because of the fact that the couple had a baby that was born on such and such a date, you can't assume that they got married before that date because there are many cases in which they didn't. Uh, this was a little more like a shotgun wedding, evidently, except for the fact there was no shotgun involved. <laughs> it just kind of anticipated that situation and went and took care of it. 
But then the, the, there are other cases like this. Um, and again, from my mother's family, uh, my paternal grandfather came from Germany. And he's one of what we call my brick walls. I can't really trace him back very far. The stories from the family are kind of murky. Uh, they say that he came over on a ship with his parents, that his mother died after giving birth to him. In fact, part of the story is that he was born at sea. I haven't been able to verify any of this. And that I, what I do know is that age 17, he shows up in Buffalo tending bar and from there, he worked his way across the country doing that and wound up in San Francisco and eventually in Seattle. But the part of the family story that I was told by an aunt was that he has a German name, obviously, and his, all of his records that he are extant say that his parents were born in Germany. And she told me that the, he had told them at one point that his father had owned a lodge in the black, a hunting lodge in the Black Forest. And that was something that I couldn't match up either. I couldn't find that name in Germany in any quantity anywhere near the Black Forest. I was just hitting a total brick wall. And meanwhile, I was going through some postcards uh, that had come down to me because some of them were written in German and I was trying to go through them. And it turned out that two of those postcards were written in German and they were written to my they were they were written to a parent but they were written to my maternal grand uh, i mean my my pardon me my they were written to my maternal um grandmother basically on on my mother's maternal side rather than on her paternal side who had also had a German father and who had apparently kept in touch with German relatives. And one of those postcards showed a hunting lodge in the Black Forest. So what I finally figured out was that my aunt was thinking about her grandparents and had managed to switch her grandmother's German line with her grandfather's German line and it assigned the Black Forest Lodge to the guy that I couldn't trace. Where, in fact, I can trace the other line, at least somewhat. So that was a dead end where I had been told something by someone who claimed to have heard it <laughs> from first hand. And it turned out not to pan out. There was a Black Forest hunting lodge. It just wasn't in the right part of that family. That is really interesting because I know it can be very difficult uh, to reveal the truth to a family that has heard a story from probably multiple sources uh, and to, to try to explain to them, no, that there, there, was, a, there was a mistaken identity right. some time ago. And yes, everyone right. Is it's possible, you know, this, this aunt is actually the last one that I have and she's quite elderly, but... You know, she had it firmly in mind, and I have actually seen it written in other th correspondence. So she had gotten it in several different directions. Um, yeah, now, there isn't anybody now really to go back to and say, you know, this is the way it is. But um, I have had that experience with another story that I ran into where I have gone needed to go back and say to people, this is the story we've heard, and this is not what actually happened. So... Um, it can be difficult, but it can also be enlightening to find out what actually happened. In this case, it's just, it's helpful in one way because I now know a little bit more about the Arnold family and that is involved with the postcard. At the same time, I know less about the Dome family, which was supposedly um, involved with this. And actually, I can trace back only as far as Buffalo. So... Uh, and then I had uh, the, the story where I did have to go back and correct information for a lot of people who had heard this story. Uh, when I was still, I just was graduating from college, so I didn't pay much attention to this story at the time. Uh, 
Uh, I hadn't known this cousin particularly well, but he was a first cousin, and he was in the Navy, and he was listed as killed in, in, the, in the service. Uh, and I later heard from several aunts, not his mother, but other aunts who had accompanied the parents to do the burial at the military grave site and so on and so forth. Um, but the story that I got from several people was that, he, oh, he was, he committed suicide because somebody found out he was gay. I even got it elaborated to the point where somebody talked about the fact that they had walked in and given him a gun to do it with, and so on and so forth. So when I started doing some research into that branch of the family, uh, actually, Fairly recently, something came up about it again, um, and all I had been able to find out the first time around was I put in a Freedom of Information Act request to the military for whatever military records I could get for Alan. And they came back and they listed what his last station had been here in the U.S., and then he had gone to Guam, and then it said he was killed in action. And this was in the mid-1960s, so it was before the Vietnam War had started, and I thought, well, you know, killed in action, that's not war-related. And so I was buying the family story. And then recently, Fold3, which is a subscription site that does military records, had a blog post about accessing military records, and I put in a question about how I could find out more than just the bare facts that I'd gotten from this Freedom of Information Act request. You know, it said killed in action. What did that actually mean? And one of the people on that list responded. He was a former military recruiter and somebody who's been very interested in military uh, history as well as genealogy for some time. And he said, well, send me a copy of the records. So I did. And he came back to me and he said, no way is this story about suicide and homosexuality true. He said, I know what the terminology is. They would never have put, there would have been other terminology for that. They would never have put down killed in action. He said, I suspect that this guy was actually in one of the covert um, missions over Southeast Asia at that time that they could not admit to. He was a radio man. He was apparently flying with people that may very well have been doing these reconnaissance missions. Something happened, they were killed in action, and that's all that the military wants to tell you. But he said, no way would it have had anything to do with those other stories. He said, I've been part of situations like that for other people, and I know what they put on their records, and it's not killed in action. So he said, in fact, you should see whether or not you can find out anything more. He might be eligible for the Vietnam War Memorial. I haven't had any luck with that. Um, you have to go through your congressional office. I tried that, and they said, no, those records are still closed. Um, and he, the, the military would make that determination themselves. But at least I know that the family story was not true. And in this case, I have a number of, of relatives, including um, several of my nieces and nephews who are still in the service or who have been in the service, where I think that this has meant quite a bit to them to know that that was not what actually happened. And I just wish my grandfather were still alive because he spent his life practically in the National Guard and um, in, on active duty and otherwise and would very much have been um, comforted to know that that was not what the actual, that the real story was, that he actually did die on a mission. That is a very interesting story. Uh, do, you, do you have uh, any speculation of how the, this, this story uh, was started? Yes, the only thing that I can think of, and this was kind of borne out from my correspondence with the military guy on Fold 3, is that because of the fact that it was so hush-hush, they would have given no details to the family at all about how it was that he died, why it was that he, he, he was killed, um, and, in fact, it would have been so hush-hush that in those days they probably would have tried to figure out, well, why was it, what is it they're not letting us know? And then they would have put together their own story, their own backstory. In fact, I think from other anecdotes, Alan probably was gay 
Uh, the family sensed that, um, and they just seized on that and built a whole alternate story out of it. And I still don't have the whole story, but I have enough of it now so that I can be pretty sure that what they put together was wrong. So it's a very comforting kind of thing that I could find out from doing this kind of research. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's really important uh, to realize that uh, genealogy can be just collecting dates, but if, if you go a little bit deeper, sometimes you can uncover... You get real a real surprises. history, you get a, a feeling for your family on what they were like, um, and you can find out some interesting stories, like Eliphalet with his um, stabbing somebody and apparently going to court and making his case that it was self-defense. Uh, you can you can start to put the flesh on the bones yourself. You just need to make sure it's the right bones. Yes. And that's what I found out with the case about Alan and the and the military death was it wasn't the right bones at all. But I found out I know where he's buried. He's buried in Colma. Um, you know, but that was all we knew, really, mm -hmm. until I started digging into it. All right. Well, do you have anything else to share? Oh, well, I have one last, last little thing, and that is that, that there, you know, sometimes you can get the information not from elderly aunts. You can get the information from other people who are doing, doing research on your same family tree. And unless you check the research, you may find out that you're still being led down a kind of a side path. And the recent example I had of that was somebody from my paternal grandfather, uh, grandmother's side um, who had been, re she had a lot of information about relatives that I did not have because um, this, my great grandmother had moved from Maine to California uh, to in the 1860s, 1870s and had essentially disappeared from the knowledge of the branch of family that stayed back in Maine. So when I got back in touch with the Stinsons from the Maine side of things and said, oh, well, here's my grandmother and here's the information about her. And they said, well, oh, here, here's, here's all the information we know about the, our branches of the family that we've been putting together. And one of those was about a relative who had moved out to California, gotten married, was living in Santa Rosa, and this was in the uh, mid-1900s. She was living in Santa Rosa, and her, she had children who had moved up to Oregon. And so the only notation on her, on the record that my cousins gave me about her death was the day, the, when she died, which was in, I think, 1960, and the fact that she had died in California uh, on a train returning from Portland to California was the family note. So I went looking for a death certificate for her to verify the date that they had given me. Most of the other stuff they'd given me had proved out. I could not find anything other than a notation. I could find one entry, which was the Social Security Death Index. It's available on a number of different sites. And sure enough, it gave her name and the date of death of January 1960 and it said California. But on the Social Security Death Index, the state that they put down is not necessarily the state that somebody died. Sometimes they will tell you what the last known address is but or, and what the date of death is, but they don't necessarily put down the state where that person died. They put down the state where the person got the Social Security number to start with. So I couldn't be sure it was California. And when I realized that, I went back and started searching again. I put in her name and the date of death and Oregon, because she'd been in Oregon. And sure enough, there was the death certificate. <clears throat> and when I got the death certificate, it showed pretty clearly that she had gotten on the train in Salem, that she had been taken off the train in Eugene, which was the next stop down, presumably either ill or actually having passed away, that she was just then, she was then sent back up to Salem, and that her relatives that she'd been visiting in the Salem area then apparently claimed the body. So there was the death certificate, but it wasn't in California. So even when people have done the research, I've learned that I kind of need to redo the research for myself if there are any questions at all about what I've been handed.
And that was just one of those little things where um, I would have otherwise thought that I had all of the information I needed and written her off as being uh, the having died in Santa Rosa if I hadn't had the little note from the cousin saying she died on the train. That was kind of funny because the first thing that occurred to me was, where do I find a death certificate? If you die on a train, you're not in any given place. And I found out a lot more in trying to research that than I had expected to. But in the long run, it just showed up. The death certificate showed up in Oregon because that was where I hadn't been looking. Now, th this sounds like uh, a kind of uh, sleuthing that would take a lot of time to be sure you're not dealing with with two different people. Can you give an estimate of, of how, how long it took you to... It took me longer than it should have because I started by assuming that when it said California that she had died or the death certificate had been issued in Santa Rosa. So I actually wrote for a death certificate from, from Sonoma County and they were kind enough to call me up and say, we don't have it and we're going to shred your check, which was nice because sometimes they don't do that. They take your check and send you, we don't have it. But um, so it. And then I was trying to figure out how do you get the information, say, from Amtrak about somebody who died on the train. So it was partly my own short between the headphones, as my husband used to put it, um, where I wasn't thinking it through carefully. And once I realized that I wanted to, to get it from or the look for Oregon, it was really fast. Okay. Well, th this is a. I think this is a fascinating group of. Uh, of examples, I, I think it, it really shows uh, some of the triumphs and the pitfalls of doing genealogy. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to say uh, the internet age versus the dark ages, you know, but mm -hmm. before Google, say, mm -hmm. uh, would any of this in-depth research have been possible? Um, very little of it. I'm not sure, for example, that I would have found the cousin who told me about the woman who died on the train. <clears throat> that was, you know, purely through online research and other family trees. Uh, I would not have found the newspaper article about a lifflet, and I might have just had to depend on family letters and hope that they eventually answered that instead of just the little uh, side reference in one letter. Uh, I certainly would not have found out about my grand parents' birth certificate unless I decided I was going to go to Vancouver and look for it. <laughs> so, um, and I, I would not have found Gertie's husband in Chicago because I would not have had an indexed census and I certainly wouldn't have looked through every one that was out there. So I would say that the internet probably was the answer in maybe all of these. Um, certainly a, a big help. Oh, that's really interesting. Well, we'll look forward to hearing more of your uh, of your incredible stories. I I, th I think it's uh, I think it's wonderful to link the family history with history, so you you can see that you can see the sweep of things. Right. Happening. Yeah, and I do have some of those stories. These are more the personal ones. The the little family. How did this happen? Why did they make up that story about how my cousin died? Why did they make up the story about when my grandparents were married? Um, but there are some things too where you find out a lot about what was going on in the world at the point that your family was there uh, just by looking at some of those records. Oh, yes. Thank you very much.